Look, I know we've all seen Leave the World Behind. That one Netflix movie that gave us anxiety about society collapsing and had us all asking, what do we do if the world ends? I mean, think about it. No internet, no phone service, no Wikipedia. If the world as we know it comes to an end, you really don't have any reliable resource to access information. I mean, think about all the essentials to survival. What medications do you need for infections? How do we properly suture a wound? How much water do we need to grow tomatoes or run a crop cycle? If it came down to it, most of us simply don't have the knowledge to survive off-grid and on our own. And so, this is where this thing comes in. This is the ACID, or the Anywhere Computer for Information Deserts. Inside this waterproof case, you have a database that houses the entirety of Wikipedia, as well as thousands of survival resources, videos, and manuals. It also has a large 30,000 milliamp hour battery that can run over 24 hours, as well as charge all of your devices through USB-C. Now, before we get into the OS, let's talk about the build quality and the hardware first. Now, first off, this thing is tough. The shell is a Nanak 909 hard shell case rated at IP67. It is both waterproof and dustproof, meaning that it can handle any environment. So let's open it up. Once we open the top, we're greeted to a beautiful system inside. Now, my biggest frustration when looking around for a cyber deck or a computer that will go with me through the end of times is that a lot of those being sold involved poor construction or 3D printed parts. Now, while this computer does have minimal 3D printing, the face covers and plates are actually ABS plastic that is laser cut and custom made for this exact build. Now, for the main display, we're running a 10.1 inch touchscreen with display controls neatly on the side as well as built-in speakers inside the case. On the bottom, we also have a full-size keyboard for searching through articles, a power indicator for a rough estimate on how much power we have in the bank, as well as power switches for turning the device on and off. Lastly, we have access to a single USB-C port to charge the device, as well as a way to charge other devices using the inbuilt battery bank. And as you can see, the case is really, really clean. Very minimal with great cable management through the custom cut holes in the body panels. Now to turn it on, we just press the leftmost button on the top. You'll notice that as it's booting, the red button will also turn on. To turn everything off, we first press the red switch to let the system power off, and after a few seconds, we can totally kill power with the leftmost white switch. This will make sure that everything turns off properly and that nothing gets corrupted in terms of data. Overall, the craftsmanship and attention to detail in this device is immaculate. Now turning this on for a second time, let's look at the actual software inside. Now, the software is the reason you should be getting this device. The information in here, in the event that infrastructure fails, can be potentially life-saving. So, what does this device hold? Well, it has everything. From survival guides, Wikipedia articles, manuals, recipes, techniques, PDFs on medicine, parenting, and many, many more. It also has videos from websites such as Khan Academy and TED Talks, meaning that not only does it have the basic survival essentials, but also the deeper, more interesting topics such as leadership, managing depression, and how to have better conversations. You can browse all of these topics using the touchscreen. However, I find that navigating the menus using keyboard shortcuts is a lot easier sometimes depending on the situation. Lastly, there are thousands of books loaded onto this device. From the Gutenberg Project, which is the world's largest open source PDF world reserve in the world, to Wikibooks and other reading materials throughout the other modules. Now, if you're looking for something more specific, you're also able to search through these modules using a search bar that's on the top right. So if you're on Wikipedia and you're looking for a very specific article, you're able to just click on that little search bar, type in what you're looking for, and bam, you'll find it. Now, overall, the amount of information in this device is, is amazing. I've, I've had it for a few weeks now, and I've tried to kind of go through it every day and, and learn something new or kind of figure stuff out for this review. But even in this few weeks, I've barely only scratched the surface of what is really in this device. So if you're looking to better prepare for disaster or expand your knowledge on health, medicine, survival, maintenance, or whatever the case may be, consider getting this acid kit. And so let's say you actually want to do get one of these things. What is it going to cost you? So overall, after shipping and handling, I paid six eighty eight and forty one cents. Look, I know it's it's not the cheapest, but it's not the most expensive either. And 
in my opinion, if I want something that really will keep me safe in the event that stuff hits the fan, I'm fine paying that amount of money. But what do you actually get for your $700? Well, now let's talk about the actual hardware that's inside as well as how the software is kind of run through the system. Now, inside this device, we're running a Raspberry Pi 4. More specifically, that's a Raspberry that's got four cores for CPU with a clock speed of 1.4 gigahertz, as well as two gigabytes of RAM and 256 gigabytes on the micro SD card that is in here. The OS or the operating system that's actually being used inside this computer is called a Kiwix. So it's a Kiwix environment. Now the way Kiwix works is that it allows users to download entire websites from the internet, turn those files into what's called a zim file, and then put them onto a browser where they can then read from that device. Keep in mind, however, that Kiwix is a read-only environment, meaning that you, once you set everything up, you can't add any more information to it, you can't change any information, it's all just read-only. And that's great because it keeps file sizes low. At 256 gigabytes, we're able to fit the entirety of Wikipedia, the entirety of iFixit, and hundreds of thousands of other videos and manuals and PDFs on this small device that's only 256 gigs. Essentially, we are storing part of the internet without actually needing an internet connection. Now, for those of you that are more tech savvy, you will know that Kiwix is actually set up to not run on a singular Pi device. It's actually set up to load onto a second device. So if you set up Kiwix on your own Raspberry Pi, you will be required to use a second device to actually connect to it through Wi-Fi. For example, if I connect my phone to the Acid Hotspot and type in the password, I'm greeted to the exact same information that I'm able to see on this computer just on my phone. Now, this device circumvents this by actually logging into itself. So when you actually boot it up, that's what's happening is it's connecting to its own kind of hotspot, but it's all directly done through LAN inside the Raspberry. And that allows you to view the information on this device, not requiring a second phone or tablet or anything like that. But it's great because if need be, you're able to share information across multiple devices to multiple people. And also if need be, if you're running low on power, you can actually just turn off the screen and still run this device as a sort of base station, letting other people connect to it and grab information from it while keeping runtime low. This is great because it saves on battery, but it also still lets you transmit information that can potentially be life-saving to other people. And in this mode, the device is estimated to run over 24 hours without the screen on. As we mentioned previously, the 30,000 milliamp hour battery can also charge other devices through its USB-C connection. To give you an idea of how much 30,000 milliamps hours is, that's about seven iPhone charges in one go. Just keep in mind that the size of the battery itself is kind of a limiting factor on how quick it can charge. It's about seven hours on a fast 18 watt USB-C charger, but it can take up to 22 hours if you're just running a regular five watt charger. And lastly, it's recommended that you keep the device at or above 75% of battery to avoid battery degradation and all that stuff. So we've talked about the hardware and the software and the reasons on why you should get one, but we have to go over the cons of this device. So look, like honestly, like this thing is amazing, but there are some issues. First off, the way Kiwix works is that once you load your files and set everything up, that's it. You can't add any more information. So for example, one major limitation to the device is that it there's no maps. Outside of small Wikipedia photos, if you Google the United States, they're incredibly blurry and they're incredibly difficult to try to navigate with if you're in the US or any country with this device. God forbid if the grid goes down and you need to travel to family that might be hundreds of, if not thousands of miles away, this device can't help you. Now, I found great map resources such as Foxtrot GPS and other such devices and programs, but I can't add them directly to Kiwix. Because the way it works is, in order for you to add information, you actually need to recompile everything to let Kiwix know, hey, this is data that I want to read and access. But because it's already compiled, 
even if I just try cloning to a larger SD card and add it to the repository, I can actually access it. Like even if I try adding it directly just to a bigger drive, it's set up the same way. I know it works, so I've tested it. It doesn't let me add it. Because on top of that, of that's not how Kiwix works, Kiwix doesn't accept anything else that isn't a ZIM file. Meaning that if even if you found a way to upload your file, which Kiwix, the Kiwix company actually manages, and they're the ones who develop this, this ZIM file, and they don't accept copyright information either, it would need to be a ZIM, meaning that it can only be a copy of the website because that's what that actual file format is. And it can't just be a straight PDF or a video. You would actually need to A, set up your own website, B, put everything in it so it can be downloaded to Kiwix and to the company. And they would need to process it and then add it to the servers. And in order for you to be able to add this in, for, it's a lot. It's There's so much to it. And so because of that, there are limitations to, to what you can add to this Kiwix environment. Um, they also, while they do accept custom requests in their forums and whatnot by Kiwix, um, again, like I mentioned, it needs to be A, a website, and B, it, can be, it can't be copyright material, which is frustrating, right? If I download lessons from Duolingo or from Pimsleur because I'm trying to learn languages or anything like that, I can't actually have Kiwix save it onto this PC even though I'll have the files on me because it's copyright information. And while I understand that, there's also an issue that certain Zims at the moment aren't able to be transferred to Raspberry Pi due to the limitations on how they set up the repository. Sure, you're able to download the entirety of Wikipedia and iFixit, but more specific things that people have custom asked for and that have gotten the request through, such as uh, music theory websites or language learning material, those aren't on the Raspberry Pi um, Kiwix upload options yet. And so I can't even add those to, to, you know, Raspberry Pi. If I have a Linux device or Windows, then yes, I'm able to add them, but I can't to Raspberry. And so therefore I can't run it on this computer, at least the way it's set up at the moment. To summarize all that rant and whatever, essentially you can't add any new information to this device. You can't even change anything that's on there. Like who cares about the Wikipedia article about Starbucks when I don't have navigational information to help me read street signs and understand where I'm at or geographical points or, or topography. Like that's all stuff that, that might be important. And so this means that, yeah, I can view the information and it's great and, and it's great for learning, but I can't change or add anything new. So just to give you an example on why that might be something you might need is let's say you meet someone in a survival setting and you need to write down their geographic location and their name or and any other information you might need to, to contact them. You, you can't with this device. There's, I wish there was like a word processor on there where I could simply do simple writing, editing, viewing, and saving to the device, but that's, I don't have that access to do that with how it's currently set up at the moment. That's the limit to Kiwix. If you're doing anything that isn't just viewing website copies, you can't do it on the Kiwix environment. You can't add programs. You can't do all that stuff that you normally would on a Raspberry setup because that's not how Kiwix operates. And then on top of that, as far as I understand, there's no easy way to get a Zim reader on Raspberry. But we'll, we'll talk in a bit about the issue that this actually has when you try running Raspberry Pi OS on it. But first, real quick, let's talk about the issues with the hardware and the actual interface. First off, there's a big, big miss in not having a touchpad with the keyboard. If I ever have issues and that touchscreen breaks, I'm, I'm, I'm in trouble, like I'm screwed. And on top of that, when, as I mentioned before, when I tried loading Raspberry Pi OS onto this and just running it as a regular Raspberry setup, um, Raspberry Pi does not play nice with touchscreen only, especially with double click. And then on top of that, the only actual access I have to the Raspberry Pi or really to anything on this device is just through the, the USB-C port that's on the top right of the bottom plates. Like there's no regular USB connections that I can access if I need to upload or download files, if I need to connect antennas or dongles, anything like that, I can't. I have to physically disassemble this device 
the top plate of it to actually get access to those USB ports. But then at that point, it's like, if we need to disassemble this thing and take it apart, then why don't I just get a separate Raspberry Pi and just keep it out of a case and then use it like that instead of having to deal with having to disassemble this thing every time whenever I need to put on like a, a GPS dongle or a radio antenna. Now don't get me wrong, the Acid is amazing for what it does, but it lacks so much. Take the base station by Gridbase, for example. This is a very similar device that aims to achieve similar goals while at the same time having a much higher functionality. Now sure, it costs $300 more at $1,000 shipped, but it also has access to local Google Maps that are downloaded onto the device. And if you run a GPS dongle, you're able to triangulate your position so you know where you're at at all times. On top of that, it has VNC for encrypted chat to and from, as well as SDR radio and UHF and many more other standard channels. And lastly, the range of this device, if you want to run it through VNC or anything else, can be extended using LoRa mesh networks. Essentially, it does a lot more. But my biggest issue with this device was the build quality, with most of the face covers being 3D printed with rough finishing in the photos as far as I can see, as well as the majority of the components being mounted on the bottom of the case making it seem very back heavy versus the acid being the opposite. And lastly, I can't actually confirm the battery size or general usability of the base station because I don't own one, but from what I've seen, it does seem like the acid wins in at least the battery department. But they both still have survival repositories and information that the acid has, but I don't know if the base station has more PDFs or, or less, and I'm not paying $1,000 to figure out. Overall, the quality of the build and the setup is really what impressed me with the Acid. It really does seem very durable, and regardless of what happens, I know that this thing will be safe. Now, another option that I was exploring was the Dell Rugged Laptop from Carbon Computers. This laptop is set up to run Linux, Kali, and BlackArch for an entirely different approach. While the Dell from Carbon Computers isn't waterproof or in a Pelican case, it's an entirely different beast. On top of that, you can customize it for your own budget. Starting from 589 to 845, you can upgrade the storage and the processor in it. And on top of that, it runs a variety of hacking tools and different OSs. So if you're looking for a device to use regularly, consider the Carbon Computer Dell. On top of that, it's it's you can read and write to it. So it's not just, oh, I can access information and that's it. You can actually add notes and do changes. Now, be warned. I have not actually tested this device and the website that Carbon Computers has is buggy enough that I'm a little worried it'll be a scam, but the build quality looks great and the responses I've gotten from their team have been reassuring. And to clarify on top of all of the hacking tools that they have, they do also have GPS, RLT, FPV tools for, for your drones and quads and other antennas that can be brought separately. They also load the same survival books and information that the ACID or the base station does, but again, I don't know to what extent. But considering they say that they have over 3,000 different hacking tools across their different OSs that are all inside one package, it's nice to have. I would still recommend the ACID though, due to the longer battery life, the build quality, which really I still think is great. And it, it looks cool. Like it's cool to have the little Pelican case, you know, and, and have it all set up in, in one little spot. And it's just, it's a great ease of use. You don't have to figure out what all these devices do. It's, it's just, it's easy to run. For some final thoughts, look, as I mentioned, I, I really wish I could run this thing as like a daily driver. I write a lot, especially for this YouTube video. I spent a few days writing the scripts and, and writing notes and going through everything. And it would be amazing to be able to use this for writing and note taking. On top of that, I would love to add my own learning material. I'm currently trying to learn Korean and I plan to learn Japanese and extend my Swedish in the future. And so I have gigabytes of learning videos and PDFs and resources, but I'm not able to add them to this device. And then lastly, not having maps is a huge deal breaker for me. I don't need GPS or anything crazy, but I would love to have an offline database in this device that I could access to view streets, as I mentioned, and find my own location in the event of a disaster situation. Because here's the thing, if I can find a computer that I will use day to day, that I will always have with me, even if it's just in the trunk of my car, 
because it's so useful day to day as well as in an emergency situation, then I'm more likely to have it on me or on my person in the event that stuff hits the fan and the world turns upside down. So is the acid computer worth it? I mean, decide for yourself. Look, this thing is great. I mean, I already bought it, so I'm keeping it. Um, but let me know what you think in the comments. If you're fine with what it does, then, then go for it. But if you're looking for something else that has more capability, consider the other options I mentioned in this video. But if this is for you, if you want an acid, I will have a link to the Etsy page down below in the description. I don't make any money off of this video or any purchases done, and I'm not sponsored in any way. I paid for this myself. And outside of just sending this to the owner so they can view the video before it's out, I'm not making any changes. Like these are my first initial thoughts. Now, I will be clear with you guys. I have been talking with the creator of this device to hopefully implement some of these changes like adding a word processor and maps but a lot of these things it just comes down to the fundamentals of what this is and so there's a big chance that some of those changes don't happen and lastly i'd love to get my hands on a base station or uh, the carbon computer's rugged dell but they're really really expensive and i don't have two grand to blow on those devices but if there's enough interest in this video, I will go out and figure out a way to get my hands on some so I can do a review video for all of you guys. And that's it. Look, any other questions, feel free to uh, comment on the bottom of the video. Let me know if you guys like this, if you guys enjoy this type of content. And that's it for now, guys. Uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much for, for clicking on the video. Feel free to like, comment, subscribe. If you want to tune in for other future review videos or more photography stuff or anything you might need, Click that subscribe button. Let me know what you guys think. And uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much for watching. And I'll see you all next time. Peace.